Basically, the, the original idea was that I would give you a very brief introduction about Eastern WF, and then Umberto would kind of take over in terms of the computing hall tour. But now the the um, well, we, we mixed this up, obviously. So I'm now going to give you like a 10, 15 minutes introduction um, about why we are there and what we do in principle. So we are the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. And as you can see on the bottom of the slide, we have this kind of um, common motto, which is basically the strength of a common goal. And this is kind of um, a good introduction as well to the center, because um, in the 70s, um, basically, the a, a lot of countries in, within Europe decided um, that to do medium range weather predictions, like global predictions into the future, um, a couple of days into the future in particular, is a very, very complex thing to do and a very difficult thing to do, like I also um, outlined during my presentation earlier. And um, they said it would be useful to, to join forces here, so to kind of really come together and develop like one prediction system um, and not just one prediction system for Holland and one prediction system for Germany and for um, Belgium and whatever, um, but really to join forces and do it kind of together. And therefore, um, a lot of people came together in the 70s and discussed how this could be done in principle, how to pool resources to really um, tackle this kind of big challenge of, um, of global weather predictions. And in particular, because if you want to make a local weather prediction, so if you're also only interested, let's say, in the, in the weather prediction over Germany, if you are Germany, um, you still would need um, boundary conditions. So you would still need to run your local area model over Germany from boundary conditions that are basically given from, from a larger domain. And the best domain you can have is, is, is a global model simulation. So even if you still want to, to work with kind of the, your own local models in the different countries, you would still have an interest to have a global weather prediction system as well um, to de derive basically the boundary condition on the on the um, edges of your domain. So that's what the people did. They came together, discussed, and an Eastern WF came really out of this process um, of the, being the the um, the entity to kind of pull resources together to to make global weather predictions. And this is a slide that I like to present in this context. So basically. Um, the Eastern WF is, is um, a 24-7 operation weather service, as you've already realized by now. Um, so we really make weather predictions into the medium range, like a couple of days into the future. But we also do monthly and seasonal forecasts. Um, but we're also really um, a research institute because research is really important um, to kind of be able to, to kind of um, build up the best possible opera um, um, operational weather forecast system. You also need to be cutting edge research. And um, that's what we do. So we are um, what we call an independent intergovernmental organization. And um, we have 34 member states that are depicted on the right here. And um, you will see that they are mostly spread over Europe and with a couple of other countries in, in, in Africa and um, other areas. But in principle, we are basically European based. And um, our institute is in Reading, which is a um, town close to London, like half an hour by train. We have around 350 members of staff. And um, as Umberto has kind of just shown you in the video, um, we have also two quite powerful supercomputers on site that we really require to kind of do the operational weather predictions. And um, on top of this, we also are developing our own forecast system. And so whatever you hear um, weather and climate talks talking about the IFS, the integrated forecast system, this is kind of the system that we're developing on site to make global um, predictions. So obviously, if you make global predictions, you can't do this on your own. So we have a lot of global collaborations going on with a lot of different countries and, and med services all over the world, which um, first of all guarantees, obviously, that we also get um, data and observations into Eastern WF, but really also in terms of um, building cutting edge systems, you really need um, also this, this scientific collaboration um, basically all over the globe and um, working together with, with the brightest minds in the different countries. We have three pillars um, that I want to touch base on. The first one is basically um, the Earth system approach. So this kind of goes back to the to the very first slide when I talked about, um, when I've shown you this, um, this figure of the Earth and talked about the complexity of building weather forecasts. And it's kind of the same story here again. So if you want to make a five-day weather prediction, for example, you really need to, um, over the UK, just for an example, you really need to represent all, a lot of different processes over the globe to be able to do this. So for example, um, in a five-day weather forecast, it may well be that on the first day, there's going to be a lot of clustering of convection going on in the tropics. 
that are then kind of going to trigger gravity waves that are propagating half over half of the planet and then influencing jet positions in the middle latitudes that will then kind of introduce, um, induce changes in the weather predictions over the UK. So it's really a very coupled system and you really want to kind of represent as much of the complexity as possible or at least as useful um, to kind of improve your prediction system in principle. So to make to build our IFS, we basically have to represent um, one way or the other a land surface scheme um, that describes how the land is happening and, and how it's actually acting with, what, um, with the weather and the atmosphere. We need um, to represent um, clouds and evaporation and precipitation features with all sorts of different scales. We need to have um, a CIS model in place um, that is interacting with both the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, we need turbulence schemes both for the atmosphere and ocean. We need to represent wind stress from waves. So we basically have a wave model as well that is describing how waves are propagating and the wave height and directions and how they're interacting with the atmosphere. We want to kind of um, represent solar radiation and how the radiation that is coming in from the sun is interacting with the clouds. And sometimes it, some part of it is reflected and another part goes through and it's kind of compli complicated to, to figure out how much is coming through. Then the radiation is heating up the surface. Um, again, we have kind of long wave radiation coming up from the surface into um, towards um, the uh, um, well towards the atmosphere and going through the atmosphere that needs to be represented. We have human influences in terms of CO2, for example, and trace gas emission, aerosols, and these kind of things. We have heat exchange, and we have um, last but not least also land atmosphere coupling. So all of this is important, and we kind of need to represent all of this within our prediction system one way or the other um, to be able to kind of make good weather predictions. And this basically naturally comes with a lot of interconnectivity between different institutions and different scientists and different domains. And um, therefore we really need to talk to each other and have a lot of experts in-house um, to kind of tackle all those different challenges in the different components. The second approach is what we call an ensemble pr um, a prediction approach. And what is done here is um, that you start from initial conditions, your weather prediction, and then you perform prediction. Um, but it's not only important that you will be able to um, to describe the most likely scenario of what's happening in the future. It's maybe even more important that you will be able to also understand the uncertainty that you have in your predictions. So if you, for example, um, take the example of a, of a tropical cyclone, which is approaching the US coastline, it wouldn't only be good to know the most likely point where it's going to hit the coastline. It really also is very important to know probabilities um, where it's going to hit, for example, um, a 10% probability that it's going to hit a town like Boston or so. So it's very important actually also to get uncertainty quantifications and to get probabilities for the predictions. And um, the, the, and it's the best way to do it is to run an ensemble simulation. So here we do not only run kind of a single forecast trajectory, but we run 50 um, forecasts that are kind of very similar to each other but they're not exactly the same because they're starting from different initial conditions, but they also have different forcing, um, forcings, in particular stochastic forcings that are added to the different trajectories. And then we basically will get 50 different um, realizations of the future, for example, of temperature over Reading. And from those 50 realizations, we get an idea about the probability of the different, um, well, predictions going to be being true or, or false. For example, the probability of having temperature above 20 degrees, for example, in three days from now. And that's really important information for the user. So that's the second pillar. And um, the third pillar is, is scalability in high performance computing, which fits very well to the summer school. <clears throat> so basically the idea is here, um, if you wanna be more accurate in your predictions, you typically require at one point higher resolution in your forecast models. If you want to look um, further into the future, make a longer range predictions, you also need to some extent more um, realism in your models and also need to add some more model components. For example, um, a season prediction, an ocean, for, an ocean model will be very, very important, whereas for a two-day prediction, maybe an ocean model is not as important. And also, if you want to be more reliable, you also want to work with more ensemble members. So kind of to get a better and better impression about your probability distribution, you, you need more and more ensemble members. And we typically run with 50 ensemble members in a, in a, in a 10-day forecast. But if you wanted to kind of get a better sampling of the probability distribution, you would even need more um, ensemble members. And if you look into the, the, um, the plot on the right, you see a plot which is kind of um, indicating computing power against improvements. And you see um, those three different approaches, basically, um, 
how they impact on the compute power and the impact is quite clear it always goes up and um, like exponentially for resolution for example and a bit linear with all the ensembles but in principle always um each of the if, if you kind of want to have high resolution more realistic models or large ensembles any of the only any of these will increase your compute power but also um we learn from experience that this will also kind of lead to improvements of the forecasts so therefore high performance computing is important we have a high performance computer on site as umberto has shown and um, this is one of the pillars um, that we have so capturing the weather um i'm sorry that these slides tend to jump to the next slide and then go back but never mind i'll I always do this and um you don't need to bother with this too much so First of all, we need to know what is out there, right? What is the situation of the weather right now and not only local, but really global. And we do this by um, collecting all the different weather observations that we have. And we have by now, we, we work with something like 800 million observations come into Eastern WF every day. And um, those observations really come from lots of different sources. So we have we have radio sounds, we have satellites, aircraft, synoptic um, observations, ships, boys, whatever. And um, so very different kind of observations come onto the site, in our process, uh, it's very difficult to single out um, which one of those observations is kind of the most prominent one. They are all important. Um, and they are kind of also, well, yes. So so basically, we get all those informa all this information on site, and we process it and kind of bring it into um, a, a format where we can use it then, then later on uh, in the data simulation. So, no. The virtual world, um, wait a second. So this is slightly wrong. It should be 800 million because this number kind of increased over time and we haven't changed the slide yet. So we get all this information on site and then out of those 800 million observations, we basically um, single out um, on the order of 40 million observations that we kind of trust most and that, that we think are most appropriate. And then we um, use those 40 million um, observations within our data simulation system, which basically means that we now bring together um, the forecast model with the observations and kind of try to isolate the, the, most, um, the, the most optimized initial conditions for our predictions. And this is requiring a lot of computing power already. And um, again, the slide wants to illustrate um, the different connectivities in the system. So if you have, for example, a tropical cyclone um, which is over the Atlantic um, at day one, it may well be that this, um, basic, this, this cyclone is, indicate, um, is kind of leading to, it's, it's causing heavy, heavy rain event in Europe a couple of days later. Or, or on the other hand, if you um, analyze dry conditions and high pressure um, fields, actually this helps to kind of also predict heat waves. So there are a lot of connectivities in the system that, you, that are not very obvious. And this really means that you kind of need this um, Earth system approach where we try to represent all of those components. And also um, the wind is going to impact ocean waves and um, there's going to be then like obviously uh, a feedback again back to the atmosphere um, sometime in the future. So uh, beyond weather forecasts, if you make um, weather predictions and you get kind of um, results from the um, from the prediction systems, for example, you, um, you, you are able to kind of predict droughts or, or dry winds. Um, if you combine this information, you can also kind of um, distill more information out of this. So for example, oops, hang on, jumping. This information about droughts and dry winds will, will help you to kind of learn something about the potential of wildfires, right? So there's basically more to the prediction just than the information coming out of the model, but this also requires post-processing and domain knowledge to kind of combine the information to do something useful and, and maybe in, in kind of on different subtasks. And the same is true if you, for example, take precipitation and soil moisture, um, this will give you a lot of information about um, predictions of flooding. It's not necessarily a trivial thing to do this, right? If you, for example, take precipitation um, and soil moisture information from the forecast model, you would still need some sort of river modeling or some sort of understanding of how, what actually means that if, it, if it's ra raining um, in this area today, what does it mean for flooding in, in another area later on? So it's not necessarily easy to kind of make those connections, but still there's a lot of information that can be post-processed and understood to kind of really use it, help the user. Um, so from raw data to real world value, basically how are our predictions useful? Um, 
obviously there are a lot of application areas all over the place. Um, but if you think, for example, about agriculture, um, there's well, there's an obvious meaning to it that that um, um, sorry, farmers are really interested in getting weather predictions in something like a, um, in, in correct information about weather predictions, not only in terms of the next, for example, two, three days to kind of get the crop in, for example, at a certain time when they need um, no rain conditions or something like this, but also in terms of seasonal predictions, when you kind of want to make decisions of um, what crop type you want to work with or um, these kind of questions. And even if you think about climate, this is so interesting, right? I mean, how can you maybe change your crops that you're working with uh, in a changing climate and to avoid these um, losses of, of, of the, the, the crops in the end. Then there's transport. Obviously, um, you want to check the weather forecast if you are um, operating an airport. But also, if you think about, for example, shipping forecast, it's interesting to know where the tropical cyclones are going to be in a couple of days. And last but not least, also industry applications, for example, um, renewable energy planning. Um, it is quite important um, to know how much wind there is going to be in the Northern Sea, for example, because um, you would want to kind of um, know how much energy would, would require from non-renewable sources like coal, for example, very well in advance because it will take some time to kind of fire up a coal plant and these kind of things. So it's, it's actually important also um, to know um, weather predictions for industry applications such as renewable energy. Okay, um, this is basically just uh, showing you um, the different timescales we'll be looking into. So we're doing global predictions, and typically, I would say, um, maybe Hilda can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say that the medium range is probably the, the most important product that we have right now, where we basically look up to 15 days into the future, and we really try to represent the entire three-dimensional state of the atmosphere, and we really try to make a prediction, for example, how is precipitation over Reading going to look like in four days from now. And... Um, this is not only, as I, as I told you before, it's not only the deterministic prediction with a single trajectory, but really also the ensemble is going to is very important that we have um, all the probabilities of the um, the likelihood of our um, of our predictions. Then, if you kind of want to look further into the future, you basically um, make weekly predictions, um, and it's getting more difficult to, for example, predict the temperature at Reading at a specific point and point in time. So what's done there is mostly that you look into like anomaly fields. So you rather think about um, whether it's going to be colder or warmer than usual over Europe, for example. And again, this kind of information, for example, is very important for renewable energies because um, if energy trader know already um, that it's going to be very warm and sunny in, in Spain, this is going to have an impact on the on the um, on the energy price, for example, over Europe. So there are definitely applications that are really kind of um, uh, where, where this information is really helping already and we provide this information within our forecasts. And then also if you look into the longer range, so this is really about monthly, so if you look at the x-axis here you will see really kind of a couple of months into the future and um, there it's very difficult to um, to make specific predictions for example for just Reading or just another town at a specific time, but what you do there is, is more that you think about like global indices, for example how the El Nino um, is going to behave in the next couple of months. Is it going to be stronger or weaker? Which then indicates also like um, that it's going to be warmer or colder in certain areas of the of the globe. But the uncertainty also increases, obviously, as you go further into the future. So the uncertainty range is kind of indicated in the slide by the ensemble, and you will see that the spread is quite significant. Okay. Um, it's not only weather predictions we're looking into. In particular, working together with the European Union, European Union we have a lot of different um, things we're looking into. One of them is um, atmospheric model monitoring. So this is more like it's not only weather and temperature and precipitation, for example, that's interesting, but also it's interesting to know um, how atmospheric chemistry is evolving, for example, and, for example, how CO2 is evolving and ozone and, and these kind of things. So it's it's kind of really um, monitoring and predicting the atmospheric states in terms of atmospheric chemistry as well, which is one of the CAMS Copernicus services. Then we also considering climate change, obviously, um, just to give you one example, the IFS model that we're working with is used as the atmosphere model of, of the EC Earth um, climate model, which is developed in Europe. So um, this, these models can also be, be used really for climate change. We're also looking into this. And then, obviously, and down the line of, 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 of usefulness of our, our predictions, we also think about flood forecasting and fire forecasting and many other things in, um, in kind of in a close collaboration with the European Union and European Union projects. 
And I think that's all that I wanted to tell you about. Um,